Peter, we see this story and we keep hearing that the leaders of al-Shabaab have been killed. There's news stories almost every other week about that. They've lost territory inside Somalia. So how does this happen? How do they have the capacity to carry out something like this? Well, several things, Kathy. One is that they certainly have lost their leaders. Uh, the emir of uh, Shabaab was killed in a drone attack uh, last September. Their head of international clandestine operations was killed just a month ago by another attack. But these are single individuals, and they can be replaced very easily. And the loss of territory, although significant in the war against Shabaab, has meant that actually, ironically, the more radical faction, which was less interested in governing in Somalia and more interested in becoming a global jihadist group, is now in the ascendancy. They, they're no longer shackled to Somalia as a country or holding territory or governing. They can now operate, as they have, unfortunately, and recent months have shown us, with impunity in Kenya, tried an attack in Uganda that was foiled, and I th unfortunately, I think we're going to expect more of this. And this is just an awful one, this attack on the school. What does it tell you about their level of capacity to organize something like this? Does it seem to you like a well-organized attack? It was well-organized in the sense the target was well-chosen. There are several institutions of higher education one could have picked if one is looking for institutions to attack in Garissa, but they chose the one which was uh, Garissa University College, which is affiliated with Moy University. So it was the one that had, if you will, proportionally a larger non-ethnic Somali student body. So they would likely get more non uh, more non-Muslims to kill. They also picked an institution that was less well guarded. Other institutions were apparently warned or had received warnings. At least that's what I'm hearing from talking to people on the ground and had their watch up. And they succeeded at very low costs. Uh, one has, hates to be clinical about it. They lost reportedly four fighters in this. They scored 147 human beings, innocent students that they killed. And now a group that had been on the wane is back in the news. They're getting that fill up that they've been overlooked in the ISIS, Boko Haram, and other groups. And now they're back in the news as a Right, so they now. get a certain amount of international attention, which I guess is what they're after. Do they also succeed in spreading uh, sectarian divisions in the communities? I mean, the clinical way in which the survivors are saying they separated the Muslims from the non-Muslims and they shot the Christians there and then. What does that do to the community? That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get this division within Kenya. Kenya has a history of of living together, Muslims and Christians, and they're trying to get this division. We saw it in attacks at the end of last year when they separated Christians at the miners, uh, the quarry in uh, Carmi, the, the, the students and teachers on the bus that they stopped near Bandera. This is a new spin on their war of brutality. Okay, Peter Fan, thanks very much for coming in. Thank you.